but of course I'm reading one right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's this this effect in storytelling, and I think so. A lot of people kind of call it this subversive storytelling, and I don't know. Again, I haven't read Blood Meridian, so I don't know how much it goes into there. But I don't think that it is like intentionally subversive at all, because I mean, again, I grew up in kind of like a storytelling household, right? And what seems to be the case much more is that um, with every story, there has to be this this um, need for every author to kind of like give the story a new paint, to retranslate it, right? That is the great, the great task, even in religion, right? Like there isn't like re any need to reinvent Christianity. There's just a need to retranslate all of it, right? So um, what I'm kind of thinking with these kind of things is that um, what, what's rather happening is that the people are just unable, like, like humanely or like morally or whatever, like as a person, unable to in any shape or form do these works any sort of justice do these kind of like tropes any sort of justice and though so they start to hate them right kind of like how uh, a guy who like the the nerd in a in like a classroom starts hating the pretty girls because they don't want to go out with him so he'd rather resent them than kind of like be faced with his inability to you know be with any of them yeah um, yeah, I think that's definitely going on. Definitely going on. Okay. Anyways, um, let's get to Prussia. the meat and potatoes of yeah. Let's get to Prussia. So, uh, welcome back, everybody, to this next episode of um, Art Germania and the focus series on Prussia and the Hohenzollerns. Uh, today, we're covering the person of Frederick the Great. Kind of asking the question: Is it really Frederick the Great? Um, I, I would always say be skeptical of any proclaimed great man of history. I'm not a total like enemy of the kind of idea of a great man of history, I, uh, idea of history. I mean, Christ, for example, can very easily be pointed to as a great man of history. Um, but just because there might be something to it doesn't mean that anybody who has this kind of reputation really is one of those. With me again is my uh, beloved co-host, Christopher Sandbach. Christopher Sandbach, of course, a historian with a murky past. Not much is known about Christopher Sandbach, so I will uh, give some light on it. And that is, I will be going into Christopher Sandbach's history in the Italian mob in New York back in the day, um, where, amongst other things, as a bookie, he was kind of involved in a shootout with uh, an arrival Irish gang and in a in a room in which he was kind of doing the books for the Italian mob as one does he was cornered by an Irish mobster uh, the Irish mobster had a gun he was threatening Christopher Sandbach but Christopher had nothing to defend himself so he kind of took two trinkets from the wall and he kind of smashed the Irish mobster's head with, in with it which makes him the first person in history to be convicted of a knick-knack paddywhack uh, <laughs> okay but on a more serious note, um, yeah, today is the uh, the topic is Frederick the Great. Any first any first notes before we kind of get into the shtick, Chris? No, but I was like, I didn't anticipate the great man of history topic coming up, and I can't imagine a better person to use to talk about the concept of the great man of history. Uh, <laughs> Cause he's, yeah. it's one of those things where like, there's some people that like, it's like, oh, okay, if there's, if, if this theory has any truth to it, at all this guy's on the list and you know, there's somebody like napoleon frederick the great's more interesting because whether or not he is one is has always been contentious okay you know so so you really get to find you really get to navigate some of the textures of the history of the great men of history when you uh track the discussion about frederick the great in that question who well, was a tongue yeah. twister and i mean um I, I said this to you in the pre-show, but I will definitely repeat this. So I was in German school. I took the German history focus course. Now, I would say the German history focus course in German school is actually very good. A lot of people kind of will lament things um, about like the, the over-education about the Third Reich. But I would personally say the things you learn in German history focus course, uh, focus course on, for example, the, um, the Holocaust and stuff like that, I think in America today would probably get you canceled by the ADL because I kind of later got uh, being an internet savvy person myself, 
kind of got into those debates and kind of read through those debates on, on like various forums and so on and so forth. And the site that is called the deniers is actually much closer to what is the established historical kind of like uh, idea about what actually happened. So for example, you get taught in folk, like in the focus course that um, all of this um, happened as a result of the war and not as something that was like premeditated and planned and like an immediate development out of any kind of sort of character or like culture or whatever. Of course, there was like the, the culture before that. And of course, these things were all kind of like set into place, but you don't get taught this kind of idea of history where there's just all these really angry Germans who want to take it out on the Jews and you kind of like get a way more nuanced view on that kind of stuff. So in many ways, the German uh, focus course on history, I would say is actually very good and very free from pro propaganda. And the two interesting persons whom, whom, uh, where there's an exception here are of course Bismarck, who we get into later, who suffers from a similar fate, and Frederick the Great. And I remember vividly um, in, uh, when I was on the focus course in my first textbook for that course, there was this uh, two-sided spread. And on the one hand, like on the one side, we had, um, we had uh, Louis XIV, the, uh, 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 the Sun King. And of course, it kind of like, it, it, it almost did this kind of like framing job with like people like uh, quoting historians about him and so on and so forth where it kind of went into the direction, kind of like pointing out his, um, his portrait, where it's kind of like, it's all about him. Um, like everything evolves around this king. By the way, this is like shortly before, like two generations before France falls to, falls to the revolution. And it kind of gives this, uh, this idea of Louis XIV really being kind of like a bad king, a failure of a king, an egomaniac, that kind of person. And then on the right-hand side, there's this, uh, image of uh, Frederick II tending to the German potatoes, and it kind of has these like connotations also from historians and from from documents and so on and so forth, which makes him this king of the people, really humble personality, only there to help, sees himself as a great servant of the people, and it kind of goes into oh Prussia grew into one of the major powers in Europe and so on and so forth. So it very much gives this kind of idea of. Uh, setting these these two personalities against one another and basically making it a good king, bad king kind of scenario. And let's say my opinion of Louis XIV isn't that high either. And I actually like to liken him and other figures like him, these quote unquote Apollinarian figures, uh, even to the Antichrist in many ways. But um, there is uh, definitely also much to be said about Frederick the, uh, Frederick the Great in this kind of in this kind of scenario um anything you want to say about that well i mean i just said the point because there are a couple of you, you point to these two kings in particular the sun king and frederick the great and you know the the, the concept of the one of the reasons that you probably run into a little bit of a propagandistic description of them because there are certain if you're teaching a history course okay this is you know insider scoop on teaching a history course <laughs> there are a couple of there are always a couple of like third rails that you can't cross okay this is kind of one of the problems where such you know somebody like Fichte ends up getting run out of a his professor's chair for crossing one of these third rails. But in, um, and in German history, it's in American history as well, and in British history and in French history, this generation is very important for the mythological foundation of the regimes that currently exist all of all over the world, far more so really than the, than, than the Holocaust is because what, you know, it's kind of like how, you know, when so this is a, a concept from physics, you know, as soon as a projectile takes off, you, you lose control over, you know, you lose control over, over where it goes. So whenever you're firing a projectile, you want to be very careful with your calculations ahead of time. And Frederick the Great is so near the beginning of the history that That they're very assiduous in cultivating exactly the, a, cultivating the correct image of Frederick II for Germans is very much like 
cultivating the correct image of George Washington for Americans. And this is a, a very familiar scenario where even the other founding fathers, this is a strange thing about American history. The other I think I think this is not just on my side. I think you're cutting out a bit at the moment. I don't know. Can can someone in chat uh, please tell me if Chris is cutting out right now? Logical, you know, like well, idealized figure, and it kind of stands out that this is like the only guy that you, you can't. You can't go after this guy. <laughs> and Chris, uh, Chris, uh, just just for your info, um, you you're kind of like cutting out. So uh, we we didn't get most of that. Um, yeah, uh, I I hope you can fix it. Can you just tell me if you can like easily fix it or not? Um, and then we'll see how we kind of progress with that. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, okay. Chris just told me this is going to be a thing. Um, I guess we just have to live with it this stream. I'm sorry about that, but um, yeah. Am I back yet? Yes, you are. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I thought I had okay. fixed the problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely, uh, and I, I'm very much in agreement with you, which is why I, I want to do this episode focusing so intently on this man, um, that our our situation is is way more founded in this like 17th and early 18th century history than it is in anything that happened like in the last 100, 200 years. And um, there is this necessity to kind of rid ourselves way more of these older lies that have been agreed upon uh, than these younger ones. And, and the figures I definitely want to attack because I think I, I said on an earlier stream that I didn't want to get into, um, or maybe I just did it off air, that I didn't want to get into um, uh, nationalist socialist uh, history and kind of like said all of that this we will deal that as kind of like topic non grata. I have reversed my decision on that, um, mainly also because I've just been confronted by so many idiots on the right wing who kind of like think that everything went wrong when the nationalist socialists kind of lost the war, which is, no, this is way closer to the the fundamental things that you cannot, the fundamental paradigms in the West that you cannot question, but which are very like, instru like instrumental in bringing about the situation that we have today. And we will see later in Frederick the Great, if he was alive today, he would be on Twitter praising Rick and Morty. You will see that. Yeah, um, I think that's okay. A that's a that's an excellent uh, that's an excellent comparison. Like, yeah, if Frederick the Great is around today. He's a blue, he's definitely a blue check on Twitter. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's get first into the man himself, and then uh, we'll later also get a bit about the history of the man and and kind of like trying to yeah open up this weave that has been like constructed around this historical figure and kind of trying to tackle it from different sides. So um, one of the, uh, definitely um, the main attributes of, of Frederick II, of Frederick the Great, is that he's a bookworm. There are about 30 books published in his name. Um, and they are all, and, and you can already kind of start telling his character just through this. They're all written in a similar style. They're distant, cold, mocking, and ironic. And that is kind of his character. He's this and, and we will later also talk about Voltaire and other people at the time. He is this uh, flamboyant, extravagant, ironic, uh, cynical figure who like, he, he writes and behaves a lot more like a moody teenager than he does like a, um, you know, like a sophisticated statesman or like, a, uh, like an authoritarian king. Um, not not totally. So of course he's more intelligent, and um, in many ways, like he's an incredibly intelligent man. Right? But um, there still is this this sort of like nonchalant cynicism that you that you can just easily glean from his writing. Um, he also has this in in his kind of like ideas of, of of books, and and he loved to read, even though he mostly so he only reads really two kinds of books. 
he reads uh, classical books, you know, so uh, like Roman authors, Greek authors, stuff like that, or the entire ancient world. And then he reads enlightenment books. So he reads Voltaire, he reads Rousseau, like everyone who's kind of around at the time. And um, he doesn't really read anything else, but he just consumes this kind of like, um, yeah, like neoclassical and classical literature, um, like up and down. And he is, that is also why he is so in vogue with the Enlightenment uh, or what is called the Enlightenment and those figures at the time, because he is a huge, uh, I guess we can just say fan of their work. And something that also marks him out here is because um, this, this entire movement, this entire kind of like new, uh, like reason obsessed, um, always cynical, always kind of like, uh, like drenched in feelings of superiority and uh, feelings of kind of like, or even just pride uh, movement is centered around France because, and we talked about this um, the last time uh, we were on stream together about the changes that uh, these absolutist styles of government bring into the countries. And what really happens is that um, the upper class of these countries becomes this bored, emotionally immature, moody kind of, um, kind of milieu. And uh, that just starts inviting a new class of people, while at the same time you have this other milieu of the people like the uh, the officials, the bu uh, bureaucrats, basically, who are very like no nonsense people, um, and who run everything. And this kind of like reality on the ground um, really invites a certain a certain cynicism, a certain nonchalantness, a certain approaches to life. It's very easy to fall into just decadence, right? So um, even though there isn't like we, I don't think we can speak of a real decadence. There's a sort of like spiritual, moral, ethical, philosophical decadence that's going on. And the people who come out of that are those who kind of call themselves the, the philosophers, the new philosophers, basically, likening themselves to figures like Plato, likening themselves to figures like Aristotle, taking that prestige that these thinkers have for themselves, but really only getting popular amongst like the, uh, you know, the, the rich and entitled people of the world. And so Frederick is, is a, a distant member of this movement to such a degree that he actually loves um, reading and writing in French whilst he hates reading and writing in German. And I can't go around it, but kind of miss that in the way he talks about the German authors, he kind of tries to make it look as if they're very long winded and like very self obsessed in their writing. But one of the things he uses, for example, is that he says that the verb you needed to understand the entire sentence is only at the end of the page. And I'm kind of like starting to question because as Germans, we kind of, and, and you might even see that in the sentences I string here, we are kind of people who engineer massive sentences, who have these like very complex ways of communicating, uh, like long-winded and extensive um, and complex ideas. And I'm kind of starting to question, maybe he just wasn't like that mentally astute. He was definitely intelligent, but intelligence doesn't necessarily mean that you're able to tackle with high and complex ideas if you don't really, if you don't also have the character to kind of like sit down and get through it. And there might be a very real possibility here because the Germans at the time, uh, they definitely weren't kind of like um, philosophical uh, you know, like philosophical mavericks or people who were like uh, total barbarians. Um, and they were very keen on developing a kind of like a counter to this, this new culture that was arising in France and was, of course, becoming what we call the French Enlightenment uh, through a romantic culture that focuses around um, the medieval world and kind of focuses around like, like really counters those kind of like scientific, we would call them nowadays, and reason-obsessed tendencies within the enlightenment and nowadays we really look back on that fondly and there might just be this phenomenon where he just doesn't have the character to read it um, but anyways from his perspective the germans are all savages they're all barbarians they don't know what they're talking about and they just kind of string words together to make themselves feel important 
Well, you know, it's it, 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 just to push back a little bit on this, because this is a thing about Frederick that's 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 fun, uh, especially from a professional history perspective, is that he's a very difficult figure to get to know at this point, because, again, a lot of our a lot of the methods that we use for, sl- for you know, sussing history out um, were in also inventions of this era. So he's using them on himself. And this kind of like reduces our ability to like, there are some times where it's like, how do you do you, when you're reading medieval history and it says, and somebody records the King said this, Oh, you can be relatively certain the King said that. And if the King said it, he probably meant it with Frederick. You're kind of getting, this is, this is modernity, you know? Okay. Oh, there's this idea of an early modernity. And then there's an idea and as a kind of substitute phrase for the Renaissance, a lot of times this this period will get thrown into early modernity, but my contention is always this is full blown modernity here. And yes, and and Frederick has this very public sense of how he is performing his job as king, which has a couple of strange effects. One of them is it simultaneously it frees him from feeling like he has his personal response, his life outside of his official duties as king have any consequence. He believes fervently that they don't. Um, But the other thing is that he, in his performances, so anything he says from, you know, to borrow a Catholic phrase, ex cathedra, is subject to um, being the official position of the German sovereign or the Prussian sovereign on the world stage. So you are correct. He is absolutely shit talking Germans. There's no way around it. But the question is, does he really believe this or is, does he have some geopolitical angle and he's just picking up some French stereotype about Germans and running with it, you know, because he's very capable of doing this and it, and it obscures, sometimes it obscures how easy he is to know as a historical figure. People always talk about how difficult Frederick is to get to know as a, as a, as a historical subject. And this is why, because he was very adept at this. Um, So that's the caution. I get what you're you're talking about. I mean, I was just kind of remiss by the way he phrased things. But of course, it could easily be explained by him just kind of like like trying to find justification for an anti-German hatred. Because, of course, uh, the biggest uh, war he fights, he fights against other Germans, right? So um, there is an idea there that um, maybe he he kind of like yeah like sets up Prussian culture and of course we we saw that uh, with kind of the advent of Prussia coming out of the Thirty Years War Prussia was kind of set up by France as a counter to um, to the Austrians and so there is this this geopolitical awareness of of playing these roles so yeah I definitely see where you're coming from and I actually wanted to also kind of like um, because. Um, in, in this part, I, it just kind of struck me in a way, but I definitely didn't want to say that he is, again, like, that he is an idiot or anything. And something, like the, the next thing, the next point I have here is that he's a self-proclaimed war philosoph, like a, a philosopher king, of course, also kind of hearkening back to these uh, Platonist Socratic ideas of um, a, a philosopher having to, to rule over everyone. And uh, he really uses this. He, he uses this very well. Because kind of like to kings, he presents himself as a philosopher. To philosophers, present he presents himself as a king. So he always kind of gets a gets a, a one ahead basically socially. Because in both cases, funnily enough, he's kind of the he takes up the superior role. Because uh, these roles kind of like the philosophers have to listen to the kings, while the kings uh, look up to the philosophers at the time. Uh, again, this being a period where um, ancient philosophy was really in vogue, or um, yeah, classical philosophy was really in vogue. Let me ask you, why do you think that is? Because you did point out that he reads basically two kinds of books. He reads classical histories, yeah, and yeah. then he reads, then he reads about what. What is it? And this fits perfectly well in with the milieu that we're. This is you know this is the age in which um, Edward Gibbon is writing the worst history in the history of the world. The decline and fall of the Roman Empire. It's the most yes. beautifully, it's the most beautifully written, terrible history in the history. <laughs> of the, um, yeah. in the 
and the most damaging history book that's ever been written in the in, in the Western Hemisphere. But it does this same thing. And now he does something that other writers at the time don't do, which is linger on the medieval period. And he yes. he, hates, he hates everything about it. But but does Frederick does he share this disdain? for the medieval past because this is a trope with these people they you know whenever you come up with the idea you you have this modern idea that there was a dark age yes that comes from these people because exactly. they because they just didn't talk about it for some reason like there was something about it that embarrassed them yeah and again also the decline and fall of the roman empire is something that is i definitely want to talk about on this channel because it's in england kind of like everything is going against them at the moment and there's this huge, like England develops this, before I get into your question, England develops this fetishism for Rome, already has this fetishism for Rome and really starts identifying themselves with the Roman state. And here you have this, this view on history where basically the guy goes, Rome fell because Christianity happened and Christianity is soft and weak and makes you weak and everybody's like, huh. And now we were too soft with our own empire. So we have to be more harsh. We have to be more like macho. We have to be more like the Romans. And um, we see the seeds of atheism and, and kind of like a lot of the things that we struggle with very, very deeply today, we see sown here amongst the upper class of Europe. But uh, coming back to, to um, Frederick the Great's or Frederick the Second's idea of himself as a war philosoph. Um, he never really, and, and, and he is a historian also, and, and I will mention that, but he never really gets into medieval history. As far as I know, he kind of like is not either not interested in, in the subject or just avoids it for whatever reason. Possibly because, um, again, in Germany at large, medieval history has always been very, very dominant. Back then to this day, medieval affairs in Germany, huge thing everywhere, right? Even like even to the all the non-Christians at this point, like uh, medieval affairs are actually dominated by kind of people who are pretending that there was a lot of paganism going on in the medieval world, and they're all like we're all witches and we're all druids and whatever. Right. And <laughs> but medieval history always very very popular in Germany, so maybe that is why he why he uh, ends up avoiding it. Maybe he just doesn't care. Maybe it's just outside of the books he reads, right? Because even though uh, many of the quote-unquote philosophers of the time it do exactly this, kind of they dunk on history and they give us this idea of the quote-unquote dark ages because, of course, that is their in to, um, to uh, attack who are basically the people who hold the legacy of power but have given all the real power away already. So that is how they attack their legacy and the kind of the titles that those people in power hold. Um, maybe he just isn't interested in that because he is a piece of that power. Um, but what has to be said in his definitely about him is he does get fairly closely to the idea of the war philosoph and, and the combination of that because he does write um, philosophically and even though I would like mark up all the philosophy of this time as let's say, second rate and more close to sophistry than philosophy, it is nonetheless a great mental effort and it nonetheless tries to uh, wrestle with important issues of the time. And he very much does so in an intelligent manner. But what he really does, what I would say is something that's definitely respectable about him, is that he doesn't fall into the trap that most philosophers fall into. He doesn't detach from reality because he always is eager and keen to kind of like um, combine his philosophy with praxis. And of course, he has endless opportunity for praxis, running his state, running his wars, so on and so forth. So he never really loses that grip on reality that goes lost for so many philosophers, um, whilst also never really um, like getting into this, this um, let's say, repetitive motion that people tend to kind of steep into when they say, I don't have time for philosophy. I don't have time to really think about all of these kind of things. And they just kind of like uh, get into a, a slump basically where they repeat everything um, to just kind of like stave off destruction basically. Um, so that is a definite plus point on him. Um, 
Then something that's actually probably more interesting about his character and more in a way to kind of glean his character than people might think is that he's a great musical talent. And I think we can see a lot about his character just from the way he treats music because he is, so he plays the flute. Um, his trainer is one of the best uh, paid statement, the statesmen in all of Prussia. So almost, it is almost to the point to where the military fetishism that his father had um, definitely is, is, is matched with his sort of like idea of, of making music himself. And I'm very specifically saying making music himself because even though he was a patron of one of Germany's uh, great composers, Bach, um, he was never really that, like, that um, interested in really, let's say, developing Bach, right? In really, um, he, he never was like a, a great patron for Bach in, uh, in a way in which people were great patrons for people like um, uh, Da Vinci or other, other uh, figures of history. Um, even though, of course, he also paid Bach a considerable amount and, um, of course, saw to it that he could kind of live his life as a composer and, and become a famous composer. But he was obsessed with playing the flute. He would like train obsessively. He was incredibly perfectionist about it. And um, even when he was on military campaign, you would always hear him playing that, that musical instrument. And there's the sort of, you can kind of, I think you can kind of gleam at the real man he is in this, in this obsessive need to create something beautiful, right? Because he has this- Wait, hold on, let me ask you this. What do you think mm -hmm. about it? What do you think about his flute music? Um, he composed himself, right? He, he also- right, yeah. uh, Well, theoretically it's him. Um, um, but, and I, I'm not so cynical as to be, believe he's got, got, he's got some dude ghost writing his flute music. But so, yeah, so, yeah I think it's him. I mean, what do you I, think? Just, have, you ever listen, have you listened to it much? That's most sort of my question. I, I listen. I I didn't listen to it before the stream. I have to say, but I just listened to it back in the day. Yeah. Um, especially also when I was under the let's say enchantment of the idea of uh, of Frederick that we have later, and I remember that actually being one of those points where I was like, "Oh, he sure is a great man of history," but like his comp like his composing skills are. <laughs> there's a there's a couple of things about his music that I think or and of course I'm I'm a huge music nerd that I think yeah. are real that I think are fascinating because I think it really as a historian one of the things that fascinates me is whenever kings produce things and they, they and they pu and they and they pub you know release them for publication that's a real dicey gambit that's a real dicey bit on the part of a sovereign because you know giving anybody any information about anything is dangerous, especially if you're somebody like him. But he did, you know, he wrote these things and he thought they were important enough and he performed them for people. Like whenever, you know, they would do, they would bring people in for, the, you know, they would bring Bach or whatever in for a state visit and Bach would have to stand there and listen to Frederick play his, you know, play his, you know, flute music. And of course, nobody, nobody in the room has anything, any problem with it. They're like, oh, that was brilliant, your majesty. That was finest, finest composition in months. But the, um, there is something about the fact that he publishes this, that, or that he, that he makes this available, that he does this. And then I think it does say quite a bit about him because the proper thing, I think the proper assessment of Frederick, the, Frederick the Great's flute music is that it is, it reflects someone who has very well attuned um, mechanical abilities with the instrument. He's very good at, you know, taking the instrument from one end of its range to the other in a smooth and fluid fashion. His compositions to me all seem like practice pieces, very eloquent practice pieces is the, the, the way I would describe him. And I kind of think that way about this is, it reflects the way I kind of think about Frederick the Great as a philosopher king, which is that sometimes, and he was capable of doing both, but that occasionally he did his uh, his ability, his desire to do both led him to do neither of them as well as he could have. Um, it's very interesting because, um, again, like my personal remember, like my personal memory of listening to Frederick's flute music is is, is very vague, but it was basically like. 
I've listened to it a lot because <laughs> it, it just because I, it was a, it was on a CD that was stuck in my car for a while. So I've listened to it a <laughs> lot. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the the uh, statement that the Iron Kingdom gives about his flute music actually is along the lines of it's technically like it's technically very good, like the technicalities of it, but it's just not brilliant. Right. You know? Yeah. It's, it's like kind of like Nietzsche. You know, Nietzsche also wrote music and you can listen to it, but uh, Frederick's way better than Nietzsche was. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And, I, and I mean, I'm, I'm not from the music w uh, world. I'm more from like the, the, the painting picture, art, moving picture kind of world, cinema. Right. Uh, and there is also in painting, of course, this, um, this uh, idea, which of course was one of the uh, reasons why uh, we later had the rise of people like Van Gogh. Um, is that people were able to get really good at the technicality of painting, but they started to paint whatever be just because they could, right? And of course, that gets taken away with the advent of, of uh, the camera because now everybody can great, uh, create uh, like technically, like let's say it wasn't really good, but like technically sophisticated, Uh, or technically um, above average pictures. And so all of that painting that is really not like not interesting and doesn't really add anything and, and doesn't really uh, give the painting a character kind of falls away as, as the camera gets more and more sophisticated and goes for more than just uh, basically replace, uh, re uh, replacing portrait painting into replace with landscape painting and so on and so forth. So painters have to get better and better and better. And of course, at this point, uh, painting has become like an, a very new, very different kind of uh, art world because it still does exist, right? Um, but what painters do nowadays and the ways in which they do things nowadays are very, very different um, than what painting was before this advent. And uh, now technicality is, is, is also something that doesn't really... That's not. That's not that. I. I don't. I don't want to say it's not important. Um, even though it's kind of true, because so much of modern art, just completely or contemporary art, just completely throws technicality of, out of the window. Um, but that's a different discussion. But um, there definitely is a a noticeable shift in painting, where you have to be more able to add something to the composition to play with the composition to give the, uh, the, the picture an additional meaning that can't be derived by just taking a photograph. Um, but okay, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that foray into different waters aside. Um, he is also a political writer. He is very well known for his book, Anti Machiavel. Um, and there's actually an interesting, so this is, I don't know, how familiar are you with the writings of Machiavelli? Uh, I'm familiar, familiar with both. Um, um, with, okay. with both Machiavelli and Frederick the Great's response. <laughs> okay, so because this, so this is just some a suspicion that is creeping up on me, and maybe it's not something that I should air live on a show that I want to be as basically as as uh, good as possible. But uh, there's the suspicion creeping up on me um, that so I've read The Prince, right? And I generally fall into that same category of people who say, like Machiavellianism and the prince, they seem like different things because what Machiavelli seems to talk about is more just the way he sees the world and he doesn't really give as much, much advice and doesn't really give as much as like, oh, this is, this is how you need to do it as much as he just kind of like, says what's going on, gives examples and kind of like gives so, it off as his, as his book, right? The proper, the proper way to read Machiavelli is to recognize that it is the work of a man who is in exile with the Bishop of Avignon getting drunk all day and writing like letters of advice back home. Yeah. That's, 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 <laughs> so, that's, so, something like that. <laughs> But um, of course, this idea of like... It, anti machiavel seems to be more against the idea of and, and i've i've read anti machiavel um although i have to understand uh, i have to um admit that 
at this point, I don't really remember any of it anymore, except for that he kind of starts out with the book um, with a way of, of saying something like, oh, um, that I don't even know what he, he says about Machiavelli, but basically he's become very popular amongst all the young princes in the world, even though he gives terrible advice. Right? And there seems to be this sort of like missing the point or this, not necessarily missing the point, but he seems to be attacking more what other people in his milieu, in the social milieu, say about um, Machiavelli and think about Machiavelli, which seems to have already been this sort of like Machiavellianism, this, this cynical politicizing that we associate with Machiavelli today, um, and less... Uh, Machiavelli himself. What do you think about? Well, that? yeah, no, you see, I like Machiavelli personally, and really, and I see more of the things that people generally dislike in Machiavelli in Frederick the Great than I do in Machiavelli himself. I think, like, uh, Machiavelli is just a very, especially the Prince. This is a very medieval text, and if you consider what it is, it is a it is a plea on the part of this man to unite Italy so that it will stop being plundered by mercenaries, land pirates, and the French. Okay, that's a pretty honest, you know, it's a pretty honest scope of what, of what he's trying to accomplish here. And what he does from there is it's like, okay, you know, maybe let's not rely on mercenaries, okay? And then he's got, his reasoning for why, to, for why he does it is almost always practical. He's almost, he's almost, and so there is something in Machiavelli, which I think doesn't distinguish the ideal from the practical in a way that, that Frederick the Great does that I think is very damaging for him. And like he had, and uh, uh, conversely lands him in a much, un much less healthy uh, position than than Machiavelli himself was in because he ends up arriving at this idea of again it's like a god king um yes. that is and 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 it's you know and you you wonder sometimes it's like okay it, it, how how do you get there how do you get there from from Machiavelli You're like no 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 this is this is I don't I I don't understand sometimes how he gets the things that he gets and how he uh, how he anticipates being this godlike figure, like you, know, like what is this? How he is this really how he thinks of himself? Is sometimes how you have to question, you have to ask. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I think um, I think he wrote anti Machiavelli early in his um, early in this when I if I remember correctly early in his life. So kind of like anticipating exactly the kind of reign he would he would take. But yeah, just to give uh, everybody here a, a sort of rundown, I, I think Chris already gave a, like a decent one about Machiavelli, what he's all about, is anti-Machiavelli is really just kind of a text about like expanding state power and justifying why the state should meddle in everyday affairs. That's really what it, what it is. And he is an incredibly intrusive character in how he rules, right? So for example, uh, one of the things he has, he takes an issue with is coffee being consumed in his in his country and there's like several reasons for that if you kind of look up like um frederick the second or frederick the great and coffee you get like surf different stories but at the end of the day he um he takes an issue with uh, people consuming coffee in his country and probably one of the reasons that plays into that is that his country produces a lot of beer and has a like a flourishing beer industry, and that might be uh, threatened by people drinking coffee instead of beer because beer is kind of like the the drink of choice for everyone, and coffee is uh, threatening to replace that. But the ways he gets into that, he's like in 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 some parts like very kind of like going around the people and kind of very intrusive. All of us are kind of philosophical or like political thought his political philosophy i guess you could say is really about justifying why state expansion is always the way to go and um he does this kind of like both in his domestic policy concerning things like his dealing with estates and so on and so forth but he also does this with things like local identities he does this in his foreign policy he is a foreign politician who would he whom we would nowadays call a realist, which is something I find a, a very disgusting um, 
descriptor for what is essentially just a a a cynic and warmonger, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, not not him even even so much because there's much to be said about. And I, I mentioned that in the very first episode, right, about the position of Prussia and the necessity for Prussia to connect its lands and to kind of secure its its geopolitical existence. There is to, something to be said about that. Um, but his idea of, of kind of like what foreign policy, for example, is about is basically just clean borders and a really subject population. And, you know, like, he has no idea of, for example, helping people of the same religion, of really like um, like great promises that he has to keep, or any kind of let's say lofty ideals of of foreign policy. There's no idea to to fight for uh, other Protestants somewhere or something, and we will get into why later. Um, he just has this idea that there's certain land that I want that is beneficial to me. And I need, or this needs to be part of my state. So he radiates the state out inwardly in his, uh, in his domestic policy, where basically more and more of the of the world comes under state control. And anti Machiavel, for example, gives all of these elaborate reasons why, in the struggle between uh, everyday people and so on and so forth, why it is always the state is basically always justified to kind of get in there. And establish itself as the um, as the de facto um, kind of like decider of, of the status quo and why the state should be basically micromanaging the population. And then um, on on the on the world stage, he is just about uh, geographically radiating out the state power. And again, he doesn't like he doesn't really care for the local identities of the people he goes into. He goes over. And he just kind of wants to absorb them into the state apparatus. And this is kind of like the figure we get into and, and the figure we have to um, start of call into mind because many of the people who have this romanticism for Frederick II often see him as an enemy to tendencies that we have nowadays to homogenize populations, to um, kind of like build this, what we call the uh, the globalist agenda, stuff like that, these in incredible state overreaches that we have seen in the recent in recent times. And he isn't. He is in many ways the architect of it. He writes what, some of the books on this. He is a progressive figure, if you want to call what is going on nowadays progressivism. He is not a, a person who kind of like stands up for the little man. He is a person who thinks that the state should know what the little man is doing and again if he was alive today he would be a blue check mark on twitter and he would be requiring for everybody to hand in their guns and he would be requiring for everybody to be verified because that's just the kind of person he is okay there's a thing with him there's a thing with him as well okay and again when you refer to him as he he thinks of himself as the pinpoint projection of the prussian state and this is this idea seeps into everything with him and really it makes him, and I think people who are familiar with me know that there are parts, there are aspects of European history and politics that make me absolutely squeamish. And this really gets into one of, and Frederick to me is probably the, the most egregious offender in, in, in terms of this, where it, absolutism as it developed and really in his own mind, he begins to think of himself as the state, okay, and not of the land, the area that he is ruling as a place that is a patch of land that is inhabited by persons who have to like, they have to like raise children here, they have to, you know, they have day, they have day to day lives. And this really seeps into even we haven't talked about his martial genius yet. But there are some things that really the, the make in the way he's able to conceive the state this way um and you prussia is famous for being thought of as uh an army with the state that was attached to it and he's kind of the one this guy that this bit comes from where he is in his wars he does win a lot of very flashy battles and i'm sure we'll have to talk about at least one of them but torgau is one of the ones that i would like really always like to focus on which is this is a battle that happened deep inside what would be called friendly territory. And it was incredibly bloody. 
Okay, so there are a num one of the things that in the process of earning his very impressive military reputation, he created situations where especially Russian armies crisscrossed his his, you know, the lands that were under his under his patrimony, and he chased after him with another army that ravaged the countryside almost as badly. Okay, so there's this almost there's this idea that he as the king, in order to like project this godlike authority, that in order to do so, he has to sort of sublimate the state into this fictional entity that exists only where he is, and that he doesn't have any responsibility to keep you know, to stay out of wars that are going to cause Russian armies to come marauding across his border every, you know, every year or two, because that's the reality of fighting a war in Prussia. You know, that's going to happen. So if you, you know, any, anytime you choose to start a war as a Prussian, you know, this is going to happen. The people under you are going to suffer badly. And he's pretty okay with that. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's yeah. what, I mean, That's something something I want to uh, give a callback to here is in, I think it's my first or my second episode. Maybe it's even the third, but I think it's the second. Um, I kind of go into the different ideas of, of state sovereignty and what makes a king. And I kind of go into um, feudalism, absolutism, so on and so forth. And I kind of try to describe this process that is going on and especially going on in the Protestant world, although France at the same time is, is very much guilty of, the, of, of, a very similar, of a very similar thing. And that is in feudalism, um, the state authority, the king's authority, the king is a vessel of God, just like his vessels are vessels of the king. So there's this very easy line of authority that goes all the way from God all, the, uh, all to the bottom to the lowest peasant. And um, one issue that, that can be said with that is that it's sometimes easy to forget that there's also a presence of God at every level, right? So uh, it's not only the king who is a vessel to God, but also everybody own, uh, themselves and through their own responsibility. But the presence of the church usually was able to kind of mediate this correctly. Um, but as we get into absolutism, um, there's this, this identification first of the king with Christ, right? And here we, we, we see this, this kind of transition period of the king not being like associated with Christ, but more and, but, but still kind of serving this, this idea of a, of a larger than life personality, but now being associated with the incarnation of the state. And that is him, and that is, uh, of course, Louis XIV, uh, L'Etat Samoa. Um, the, the I am the state. I don't. I think there even is a trivia about him that he never said it, but it's kind of like this statement that is associated with it. Yeah. It's never been found. If he said it, nobody knows. Nobody knows when. Exactly. Um, so, but but of course, it's it's kind of what is said about him, and and it is in a sense believable um, because of how he basically went about his life and how he seemed to have understood himself. And um, Frederick is, is very much the same kind of person. And of course, uh, the, the way I kind of give that is, um, so, so and uh, remember the, what I said in the beginning of the stream, the two sides of the, of the, uh, of the history textbook, uh, both of those sides were propaganda, both of those sides were PR efforts basically, right? And both of these PR efforts serve, um, serve the task to convince the people that the king is a non a larger than life figure because um, that still has to exist and as soon as this image falls away so we just have like we don't have god at the top anymore right we have this man at the top and now this man is more this this uh greater this larger man who's the personification of the state as soon as this falls away then all men become the personification of the state. And that is what is right, like knocking at the door, right? That is what is happening very soon. And that is, of course, the first revolutions that kind of like take it the next step further. So when you kind of set aside the separation, set aside any kind of justification for royalty, except for, and that's also something, I, an issue I have with monarchs. Like a lot of monarchs say, have this kind of like competency idea for monarchy where it's like well the monarch has been trained his entire life to be a monarch and it's like mm, 
we know he can be trained badly. He can just, uh, I mean, he, he can be disabled, right? Like he can have a major accident and be confined to a wheelchair. Like it's not, it's not competency that makes you a monarch, right? What makes you a monarch is just that you put there by God. And uh, what being a monarch means is just, it means that you're the one who takes responsibility for the country, right? And, and then hopefully you're competent for your own good and uh, much more than, than, than anything else, right? Because if you're incompetent, usually your subject will still somehow manage, even though your country might be breaking apart, because even in, in such a scenario, most people kind of tend to manage, even though it's, of course, a, a turbulent and bad period. Um, so, yeah, he, but, but going back to, to Frederick, um, at the, he has to play up this, this larger than life persona. He has to play up this figure of himself and, and basically what, what they're really doing, what Frederick is doing, what Louis XIV is doing, what, what other people are doing. And the first person I'm always identify with this is Maximilian the first, um, what they're all doing is they're just kind of inventing different, we can almost say marketing strategies to kind of like uh, get their like they, they get their persona sold to the people. Okay, I think we can go to the next uh, topic on him, and this is really a small point, um, and that is he is a historian. Um, and as far as I know, in the histories he's write, he writes, there's like nothing that is like, say like, of, of terrible import to us. They are not much read. They don't seem to be like really influential. Uh, and, and most importantly, they are niche. They are niche works on just certain like, I think wars and time uh, periods. And um, the only thing that might be said about him being a historian is that this is a big part of where he derives his meaning from. So he has this idea of an eternally changing history, something that you can almost liken to something like the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, the, uh, the sea runs into the, um, runs into the ocean, but the, uh, the river runs into the ocean, but the river never runs out. Everything is vanity. He kind of has this idea of, of things coming to be and then uh, descending into ashes. And that is kind of, a key wisdom he sees in the world and something that he kind of like um, combines or that, that, that kind of combines and, and carries in his ideas about history, uh, especially also in how he relates it to his descendants. Because again, every Prussian ruler uh, kind of gives a, a note to the next generation of how they are to govern. And his one is really kind of like subsumed in this sort of, yeah, we, we can even say ecclesiastical idea of history, which isn't unwise, but of course omits the presence of God, which we of course have in the Bible, um, but, but isn't there. So it just kind of becomes a bit, um, yeah, a bit sophistic. And it's something that is very present in people these days. Um, when you read something like 48 Laws of Power, for example, a very widely read book these days, um, there's this idea of this overarching wisdom of history and this teaching role of history. Um, but there is nothing like nothing redemptive. What, what Chris actually talked about in the pre-show of which you only got a few snippets is um, there's nothing really redemptive about it. It just kind of sees all the empires crumble into dust and fails to really find the meaning in it. So the only meaning it derives is this kind of like uh, almost Buddhist idea of nothingness and of uh, not getting too attached to anything really, which again is not it's not without its own wisdom and there is a necessity to kind of like learn to detach from the vanities of of the world basically, but it's just not the final thing, right? It's not the the final transformation. It's not the it's not what Ecclesiastes ends in, for example. It's what Ecclesiastes starts in. And um, so all of this kind of flows into the, the biggest flaw of Frederick II, which we will get to now. Um, do we have anything to add before we go on? I was going to say a, a quick word on him as a historian. Now, this is one of the things that's reading his history. Again, it's not very good. Um, it's not bad, but it's just it's kind of like, like okay. 
if if I want to write, if you know, if I want to read 500 pages about you know this obscure topic, I could probably find somebody more recent that's done it better. But his writing on history reflects his the, his sort of mentor and his mentor character and his friend that of Voltaire, who wrote um, in what Dieter de la Diderot's, Diderot's encyclopedia. He wrote the essay on history for Diderot's encyclopedia, not Frederick, but Voltaire did. And it's one of the cornerstone, probably not many people read it today, but it's, you know, in this project of the Diderot encyclopedia, it's one of the centerpiece articles. And this is one of the most concise summations of modern interpretations of him. And again, this is actually this essay is the reason why I could, this is full turbo modernity that we're involved in here because this, you know, this essay is this is the modern, very frankly dangerous concept of history, which is that history can be divided into two. There are two main types of histories. There is what's called a sacred history. And then there's what's called a, a, you know, a vulgar history. And uh, Voltaire distinguishes between the distinguishes between the two, which is that vulgar history is the good stuff because it involves empirically verifiable facts and gives a kind of pure distillation of knowledge that can be applied to the present. And he contrasts it with um, sacred history, which is like going to be, and he likes to use Herodotus as examples. And so he takes for he takes this idea that the things that Herodotus, the thing if you're reading Herodotus's histories and you run across a reference to the pyramids at Giza, that we can trust his writing about the pyramids at Giza more because we can go see the pyramids at Giza for ourselves. But when Herodotus talks about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, that's a sacred history because we don't have the show me on the doll evidence that there were ever Hanging Gardens of Babylon. OK, and this idea, this is one of the more one of the I guess the foundational concept of sort of modern history where and especially the idea, you know, where you, there's a common modern saying that say those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Well, if you combine that with this concept that the more ver empirically verifiable events in the past have more correlation and more practical application in the real world, then you arrive at the way Frederick the Great conceives everything as a kind of budding historical materialist. OK, and the this thing that this aspect of him that comes out in his history writing is again almost like the music again it's very it tells us things about him that he would never tell us ourselves um but it does end up being it ends up being a very sterile look a sterile perspective on history that um it it causes a real rupture with the past in a way that he was okay with and rulers have been okay with for most of the last 300 years, but I think that we may now be discovering had some, had some nasty side effects. <laughs> yeah. There is, and let's, let's be real about this. There is no, like, like the atrocities of the 20th century don't exist without this kind of idea of history. Right. The, the cultural malaise that is setting in here I think people don't understand. Like this takes, like we, we are getting from what is essentially the highest developed culture in the world, right? A culture that is like, the, uh, to this day, people want to live in the West because living in the West, there's just certain things about that, about the way we live, about the generosity here, about the self-givingness here, about the ideas of honor and, 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 and how you are to live and so on and so forth. People often underestimate that if you just look at people from other countries, how they raise their children, for example. An example I like to give, cocoa melon is an effect of the, in, uh, like the rise of cocoa melon, which is a, a YouTube channel that is basically very obviously um, coming into existence because parents abandon their children, is something that is not coincidental with the rise of the internet everywhere outside of the West. 
for example, this idea of how we live in families and so on and so forth is actually an anomaly in history. And all of that had already developed at this part. And we're now kind of starting to take away from this and to develop the kind of like the cynical, the brachial, the, um, the, the very, like the, the very reality of a, of, of a, a very troubled and a very yeah, sociopathic, you could almost say, culture um, with which we have to wrestle today and where we have to, where we kind of are at this, this crossroads almost of, of seeing can the West that was uh, really win over the West that has become. And this is where the becoming sets in uh, through the top. Um, so, and, and we see this, uh, and now we, let's talk about his, his biggest flaw. This is his quote about Christianity. Let me read it. An old metaphysical novel filled with wonders, contradictions, and absurdity, born from the glowing imagination of Orientals, which has spread itself to Europe. Enthusiasts have preached it, Ambitious men, fact, being convinced by it, idiots have believed it. And of course, with the comments of modernity, this is something we could read in Richard Dawkins 10 years ago, basically right. word for word. Right? Yeah. This is where this comes from. This, so from this point on, more or less, the German state will be a force hostile to Christianity. This will mature in Germany. A lot of the ideas that Christianity is not historical comes from, especially what, uh, in parts what you say, but from deliberate efforts by European countries around starting at this time, and then again, like, like really coming into fruition about 100 year, years later to undermine the Christian story. The ideas of having disproven, for example, parts of the Old Testament, to this day, there's this idea of oh, the Old Testament basically goes into real history. And before that, like starting with King David and King Solomon and all of that, and, and of course going all the way back, that is more of a pious myth than anything else. Moses was probably real because it's really hard to kind of deny the existence of Moses, uh, especially because the uh, even Roman historians write about him. They kind of asked the Egyptians, and the Egyptians didn't say he didn't exist. The Egyptians said more like, "Yeah, yeah, he did exist, but we totally didn't like chase them into the desert. We actually chased them out. We didn't want them here, and he was a total charlatan, anyways. So don't ask us about him." <laughs> and um, but yeah, like these ideas, um, they're not like th this was never something that was like. But again, hold on, real, real hmm? quick. You can you can see that theory of history playing out here, right here. So this is okay. I mean, I'm I'm the historian, trained historian. Kind of yeah. That's my thing. This is a field that exists explicitly for the purpose. It comes into existence. Uh, God's near. He's a near contemporary of, of Frederick. Oh God, what is his name? Leopold von von Ranke. Okay. Yes. He's a he's a biblical critic. Okay. So this this is a field that comes into existence around this time, more or less, to subject the claims of the Bible to the criteria exposed, you know, it laid out by Voltaire. Okay. Yes. And this, this is what they're doing right here. They're saying, okay, so there we can, some, some of this stuff in the Bible kind of alludes to real things, but you know, this other stuff doesn't. Okay. And that's all well, like, once you do that, you know, like there you've, you've really abolished the foundation of faith and you haven't really done so for a very good reason, you know, the, yeah. the, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I felt very no, no, but it's it. it's exactly it's exactly um, the kind of things that that we have to cover and and why I, I do this series, because um, so with every with every religion and with every state with every world like every culture I see around the world, whether it be India, whether it be would be China, so on and so forth, they all start with a a somewhat decent theology, all of them monotheistic. They all devolve because they kind of make these, um, these, what would you call them? Um, uh, these sacrifices or these, um, uh, when, when, you, when you're in a deal 
uh, what people always say you're supposed to do, but which is often kind of a, a bad way to do it. Um, concessions. They make these concessions um, where they try to find a middle ground with everything that kind of gets levied against the uh, the established, let's say, lofty idea of, of the central idea. So most of the concessions are made, for example, to ruin. Um, and this is something that's very similar that kind of sets hold here. There are these concessions made to these kind of historians because they and, and to these kind of cultures because um, they, they, they enable a sort of rulership that is unheard of and that basically takes Europe by storm. And for that goal, they start chugging out, um, yeah, basically Christianity. And that is not an, like, there's not a, like, it's not a mistake that culturally soon after all of Europe gets embroidered in pagan imagery, right? Like nowadays, it, it often gets kind of like done away as kind of like a, a cultural development, kind of like, oh yeah, they didn't really believe in paganism. They just kind of like put uh, Zeus and Hermes everywhere because um, that was kind of what was in vogue at the time. But if we look at pagan history, pagan Rome, for example, they didn't believe in paganism either. Right, yeah. <laughs> paganism... It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it, and I, I think, I don't know, was it, we may have talked about this whenever I referred to it recently, that paganism is mostly a worship, worship of history. Yes. I, I don't know if you uh, were involved we in that. About this. We, we didn't talk about this, but no, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's, I would definitely agree with that. Um, it is a, like, paganism is, is mostly just kind of like with my own two eyes, right? What, like, what I can gleam. And paganism, like, especially in, in ancient Rome, for example, and that is one of the ways, if you re read, for example, Augustine, he just constantly calls them out on their hypocrisy. Because basically what they're doing is, on the one hand, to the peasants, and you see this in this quote, right? To the peasants, they treat them like idiots and say, oh, yeah, they need to believe in something. So, yeah, gods are real, and they're basically magical creatures invisible in the sky. Actually, they're up there, and they can grant you wish wishes, no problem. And then to the, to the upper classes, they're like, oh, yes. Well, Hermes is this ideal of, of communication and change and exchange and, and this philosophical concept, this constant in history and so on and so forth. And uh, there's like this, you know. So um, these, like, for all intents and purposes, uh, ending like at the 18th century, going into the 19th century, a lot of the upper class of Europe becomes pagans in the Roman sense, right? Of course, they don't make sacrifices at pagan temples. But again, the sophisticated Romans, most of them thought that these were just things they partook in because it was a good ritual for the state to exist. And of course, this is something that gets pushed even to this day, right? Like there's a lot of voices nowadays which kind of go around, especially also coming out of new atheist spheres and so on and so forth, but they kind of say things again, like like um, like Frederick here, but kind of trying to uh, defend religion that way. You know, you need religion. There's, for example, there's this scene we discussed in a room, um, Chris. Uh, I think I don't know if you were there, but it was a room in which you were in um, by Terry Pratchett about the Hawk Father, where. Um, and the hawk father, you uh, you have death, who is kind of like uh, this this wise cracking old uh, mythical entity who knows everything, and um, but he's also very cynical because it's an atheist story. Ugh. But <laughs> he uh, explains to his granddaughter um, why people need myths, and he basically goes. When you grind the universe down, there's not a single iota of justice, not one of mercy in any atom in the universe. And then basically you need to start telling these lies of justice and mercy uh, so they can become real, you know? And it's, it's, it's this entire view of this like, oh yeah, um, religion is really just a sort of a, a social lubricant and enabler of um, of 
being able to come together. And uh, that is also why, um, as this view spreads nowadays, people get more and more esoteric because as public expression of religion kind of gets reduced to social interaction, it becomes non-religious. But people need religion because, well, it's not just a social lubricant. It's the most important aspect of humanity. So they will take whatever they can get. And if they can't get it in groups, they take it for themselves. So yeah, <laughs> I'm a bit, I'm, I'm almost getting into ranting. But that is, um, that is why Frederick II's myth, in my opinion, has to be dispelled. He is hugely influential with ideas like this. Um, and let's go back a second, because the, uh, other, the, the other thing I wrote here, Macho, um, kind of like the entire culture that he sets up in his court and that gets inherited is incredibly toxic. Uh, so, for example, so so on the one hand, so he's a sexual libertine. We don't know to what degree most the person who wrote mostly writes about that. We we'll get into a bit more later as Voltaire, and Voltaire can never be trusted. Um, but here's something we do know: Jules Offray is one of his absolute star courtiers for a time, an absolute like champion at his court. You know, it's kind of like. Uh, kings at the time, they always have like this court. We, we saw this with his father, the Tabak Collegium, the guys in a room he kind of hangs out with his fraternity. Frederick carries that on. In his case, it's actually even more ruthless. Women are even less allowed. It gets like, like even more uh, drastic. And, and they're not, they're not uh, as much like bullying each other. There's not these like uh, practic like pranks they play on each other. But like the culture is still like insufferably uh, pseudo masculine, I guess I would describe it, where you make like daft jokes, you um, like always there's always like a sort of homoeroticism. Basically, I don't know like I, I, I've never been in a in of course never been in the United States military, but from what I hear, it's basically what goes on on an all male navy ship. Just, just from what I hear, um, and and from the yeah. videos that sometimes get get shared around by men on all to, we, navy ships. Are we trying to get around an algorithm right now? Is that what's is that what's going on? Is, is this a euphemism? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm referencing things I I just don't want to say. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> no, we get into homosexuality later. I'm, I'm, I'm still talking about kind of like the pseudo behavior. Yeah. They, they were like uh, cracking, for example, a lot of um, like uh, homoerotic jokes and so on and so forth. We know that about his his kind of milieu that he goes around. But they they joke about rape. They joke about especially gay rape. That's hilarious. You know, it's a real burner. Like if you can be <laughs> more crass, if you can be more, you know, if you can be even more like. Um, cynical even, then you always get the bigger laugh. And yeah. he is this kind of figure, right? Like he is an incredibly sarcastic man. He writes about himself. And this is something you see with every sarcastic person out there and every kind of this personality out there. Um, they all describe themselves the same way. They say they are a mirror that reflects the environment back. They basically say, I am always the person that stands in front of me, right? Uh, we could if you want, we could actually get a bit into the psychology of this because even Jung writes about this, about a sort of like a non-existent um, personality, right? But the idea, so for, for Jung, the idea of, of personality creation of, and of psychic health is that you need to go amongst other things through a process of individuation where you become a real human being that kind of stands for itself as its own entity decipherable from other entities. One of the ways to do this is, for example, this is something that's very often misunderstood about Jung, is to free yourself from the archetypes. That is, um, every archetype, while they are incredibly powerful in uh, navigating the world, and they are the subsects that, um, that, kind of, that the mind runs on, they all need to be pushed back. And the mind needs to understand of all the archetypes as not really existences and personalities within the mind. So a person can't understand themselves as a trickster. 
They can't understand themselves as the father. They can't understand themselves as the mother, right? These all have to be aspects of their being, but their being has to be something superimposed. Otherwise, these kind of like sub-personalities, as we call them nowadays, kind of start taking over and start contending the mind and start getting like making the psyche um, unstable effectively. And uh, in this, in this uh, process of individuation, you get the development of an idea of an authentic self that is worth defending. And before that, you can get an, and well, you can guess which, which, um, uh, which occupation suffers from this chronically. But before that, you can get into this childish notion of wearing a hundred faces, but not having one yourself, right? Uh, of being a shapeshifter. And that is an incredibly uh, bad forming personality trait because it prevents you from taking on your own being as your own person from this process of individuation. And of course, the people who suffer from that everywhere are actors, which is why back in the day, actors weren't trusted with anything. They were some of the most marginalized groups because actors very often through the through the things they do, through the work they engage in. And again, I, I am from that world. I know what I'm speaking about. They teeter on mental illness 90% yeah. of the time. Yeah, I've always thought about that too. I'm like, there's, you know, whenever you think of actors, celebrities, actors being crazy, I think like, you know, kind of, well, maybe Kanye West ain't crazy, but <laughs> with the, the, the pe people like Kanye West, that's a different kind of celebrity. And, and maybe that's not, it's a, maybe it's also a mental illness. It's a different kind of mental illness. But actors and artistic sorts that are, especially actors, when your job is to, become someone else like there's no way that doesn't have long-term side effects yeah that's why these my people father my father describes it this way my father says um because my father is a director right my father says the difference between me and actors because i kind of talked to him about it and he said he kind of started agreeing and he said the difference between me and an actor really is that i get to get, go home yeah right? an actor <laughs> doesn't go home because like the the kind of like the compartmentalization of existence that he's in uh, prevents him from really taking up because if, if acting was a job, right? If he used to say like, on the job doing his work, he wouldn't be able to act, right? So he is always kind of caught in this limbo between the figures, which is why actors can get even something that is akin to possession with the figures. One of the most recent examples, of course, being Emma Watson, who um, in her portrayal of Hermione Granger later becomes a person that exhibits these traits that are associated with Hermione Granger as a person trying to kind of fulfill this role long after the movies have, have terminated. Right? You, you can't, can't be a magical girl boss forever. Yeah. And, <laughs> and of course we know what it did to her. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, so uh, he's a lifelong misanthrope uh, who laments the evil of man, of course, Frederick getting back to him. So he is, he is this, he in many ways is this kind of like almost moody teenager character. And um, something that also has to be said about him, because, I mean, we see the, the pushing away, the kind of like the inability to interact with the female element. We have kind of like started like, like showcasing this bit by bit by bit in every episode. Also kind of in the last episode, talking about uh, what is going on in the wider culture in Prussia, where it's also starting to get into this, into this almost milieu where women are, are kind of starting to get pushed out. But even still at this point, the household still kind of works because uh, whilst the, the, the elite of Prussia are already all basically non-believers because otherwise you don't really get favor by the king. Um, of course, uh, like exemptions being people like Bach, who was so good at what he did that um he was um patronized anyways um but it kind of worked for the general population having these more patriarchal um ideas but then as the as the uh and, and we also teased that in the last episode as the culture will progress um we kind of get into the simulacra state of that where on this kind of framework that that uh Frederick is setting here, we get this return of the uh, patriarchal figure. And at that point, we really get into a household that just doesn't have a place for women, that kind of dislikes women, 
And he is the perfect symbol of that because he is technically married, but he basically sends her away, never talks to her, except for once with the uh, oh so famous statement that he basically meets her after years, years of being apart, sits down with her. And the first thing he says is, well, you've gotten fat. Of course, he says it in a different way, but it's effectively what he says. I think he says, uh, Madame is corpulent geworden. Madame has, uh, has become corpulent. But to translate it today, it's like the first thing he says to us, you've gotten fat. He is with her like in his entire life, maybe for a few weeks. Um, he completely shuns her. He basically pu pushes her to, uh, aside much more than his, his father did. Of course, there is it's always the question with his uh, very likely homosexuality that he just had no interest in her. Um, but even then, he kind of treated her like dirt. Let's that's, that's be real here. And she you know, writes about... Here's, this is one of these things. Yeah. It always, always fascinates me to ping Britain at the same time. And yeah. this is exactly the opposite thing is going on here in Britain during this. Is just, so hit, uh, George III is famously in love with his wife. Like they have a very public romance with they have like like 13, 14 kids with one another. And Prince and, and Queen Charlotte was her name. She becomes a public figure in England in a way that royal consorts really never had before. And she becomes a very strong symbol of sort of, you know, the domestic bliss that the Hanoverian dynasty is trying to project as their, you know, as their royal image. It's fascinating that they, they, they kind of move the other way. Um, uh, of course, Britain has its own problems. <laughs> okay. Say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, last things I, I want to say on this point. Uh, again, I, I think I, I, I mentioned Jules Ofray. I think I didn't say what he actually did. Um, so he was the star court here, this, this, this um, person of great renown in the state. He had this idea uh, that, that he started spreading around and that had started infecting Germany from that point on. And that is something that we have to this day, something we definitely have to fight down. And that is, he really pronounces the idea of the body is a machine. People are nothing but machines. And um, that is something that has, it's not something that like, let's say, it, it, it kind of comes to light here. It developed a a while earlier. It's been something that, that has been creeping through the underground of European culture more or less since the um, since the Black Death. And we will, in the series, we will later like start covering Germany from other sides and also uh, go through medieval history. And um, there we will kind of uh, explain also the impact that, for example, the Black Death had on European culture. But something I want to point out here is that because of the dignity that the church has allotted to the uh, human body, um, it actually turned out uh, during the Black Death that church physicians were less apt at treating the sickness than physicians who viewed the body as an, just like as, as something that was basically profane, that is something that could be treated whichever way one wanted to treat it. And um, even though, let's say, the church, of course, held its authority mostly during that period, um, a lot of these kind of um, ideas start setting root afterwards in the, in the Europe that is to come and in, to, in what we call the early modern period. And um, for many of these reasons, it is called the early modern period because all of these ideas that we associate with modernity that are breaking out here, for example, um, with the body being a machine, are being sown in that aftermath of the Black Death in that uh, 14th century, which of course was a um, 15th century, which of course were, were massively, um, let's say, culturally strong and successful centuries because the, the other side of Europe still reigned supreme, but they also were kind of like growing this underbelly of, of ideas that are frankly psychotic. <laughs> and um, yeah, and and... A lot of, especially this point, especially this idea of reducing the human body to a machine is something that I think it's, it's often understressed how much and how many levels it affects us today. 
right? If we like, just think about back about the last two years, um, the uh, kind of like the the um, stance we have on medicine nowadays is hugely influenced by that. Um, the stances we have towards um, towards religion are hugely influenced by that. So many people have developed this kind of like uh, Gnostic or yeah, like pagan ideas of religiosity where the body is something that is kind of like hindering the person, where instead of uh, struggling with the desires of the flesh, you struggle with the flesh itself, right? Um, and all of these kind of ideas, they lead into a world, I mean, we have a, a culture of, of sexual misconduct and of sexual mistreatment, really, right? of, of, of people just really mistreating themselves because in many parts, because we don't see the dignity in interactions of the body, right? Like this idea that it's just something physical, right? It's just something physical between us, stuff like that. All of that philosophically rests on this idea that the body is just a machine, right? Right. And, um, so, yeah, a huge, a huge kind of like window and history is opened here, something that will become hugely... Um, kind of like disseminated uh, throughout Europe and something that is something that, that really affects us today in, in almost exclusively hostile ways. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's uh, enough on, on his kind of like the culture he has and it's kind of macho culture. Um, we, again, we're kind of like not following the book today. Uh, the book on the chapter on which we would be uh, goes into the Silesian War and kind of uh, Frederick as a as a um, as a general. Uh, all of that we will cover in next episode. Here, I really just want to kind of like lay out the the historical Frederick the Great um, against the the man we perceive nowadays. Um, even so, I've already marked uh, martial genius as a question mark with a question mark. Um, the reason for that is, is that he, of course, uh, fights a war against Austria. Later, uh, later other powers join into the war. Um, but there has to be taken into account, A, his battle record isn't, let's say, uniquely impressive, unlike for people like Napoleon, who, has, and who can arguably be said to have been effectively undefeated in battle because the only... Like the only defeats he really had, all of them were through massive factors outside of battle, right? What? I mean, if you're, huh? <laughs> I'm just, no, sorry, I'm just gonna let it go. <laughs> I mean, okay, I, I think I already get like the, the thing to kind of like. Throw I was about there. to be some hardcore pro Wellingtonism, and I just decided just to let it go. <laughs> was 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 uh, Napoleon ever general set? To the other side of wedding. Um, like, wait, on the field. Wait, say, say, ask the question again. Napoleon lost three battles, I think. I think it was no. I think it was more than that. It's more like seven, but there's three big ones. Uh, yeah. But but at at Waterloo, which I think, of course, is the the the, the one yeah. that people immediately think of. I was like, I mean, he just. I don't. Not, I'm not sure what the exogenous factor was. There's a couple of things he did. I mean, he. You know, the Prussians wouldn't be a factor had he started the battle earlier in the day as he could have. And he just got beat by the British. You know, that's the, the, the well, he didn't get beat by the British. The British held on long enough for the re, for the reinforcements that everybody knew was coming to get there. And uh, and, you know, he paid the price for it. Yeah. A fish in, in chat says uh, Bro Napoleon in Egypt is one giant failure, of course. Yeah. Um, in Russia true. as well. I'm I'm talking about and I know that you can't really make those differentiations, and this is also what I thought you were kind of on about. I'm more <laughs> talking about like battlefield tactics uh in in this point. Um of course uh it has to be taken into account though most of the fight is I prob probably most of the fight is already decided before there is any sort of battlefield tactics like on the ground that really comes uh, to factor into play. Uh, regardless, um, I, I guess I redact that point. I'd have to say it's a stupid point. 
I phrased that badly. No, but, no, no. It's it, it just it, it triggered it triggered my immediate Anglo revision. That, no, that was, I, 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 I'm did. sitting here, and we will, and, and one of the figures of history will also cover in the series and give his own, um, his own episode will be Kausowitz because I just like the way he writes, and I already kind of like am, am set on on basically being completely trounced by Clausewitz's ideas of warfare, which of course are mostly off the battlefield, right, and right. maneuvering around it. So I can't really call someone a, a martial genius. Uh, based on, on 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 his battle tactics, um, and I also can't like ascribe the wins of and losses of individual battles mostly to his battle tactics. But I guess I have to describe it to the to the overarching war effort. Well, I mean, um, I'm nevertheless. I'm, I'm not by any means a mil military historian. Like when we talk, this is actually the, yeah, the military yeah. history is just the worst that I'm ta worst I am at talking about. That's that's the that's the because there's always somebody that knows it better than me. Yes. No. Um. But but the point I want to come to is um. So there's two things. A. So, uh, Frederick's campaigns they aren't like they aren't anything. I mean, they're not like. It's not that it's like a walk in the park, but it's not like it's also something where with Napoleon, you have this effect where he really, you can see that he's a genius because he fights. I mean, he redefines warfare, basically, right? The idea of Napoleon of, of having this like artillery led um, army idea uh, is something that just develops, develops and develops after him because it is so dominant, right? I mean, he often just gets called the artillery general, the French artillery general. Um, there isn't much of that in Frederick. Um, most of, of, of the advantages he has um, on that kind of, let's say, innovative front are innovations that actually his father put into place. Um, what also has to be taken into account when we assess, and, and, and maybe we'll just do that next episode, uh, when we want to assess his military genius, is um, that... Prussia was very strong. Austria was very weak. We just have to take that into account. Was it so much there was a walk in the park? No. But um, it is much less... So so the, the way like it is often portrayed is Prussia is basically a third-rate power while Austria runs the world. But it's they're, they're very, very level in that conflict. And the war is made more impressive because... He doesn't, if, if he just won against Austria alone, it wouldn't have been a very impressive war. Um, it is made impressive because, uh, of course, of the other sides that join and, and the coalition has, has to fight off. Um, and the last thing that has to be noted there, but, and, and, and with that, I guess I give it off to the next episode, um, is that uh, there also has to be taken into account that the coalition has massive trouble kind of organizing itself um, whilst he just doesn't because he is a single country. So that is a massive advantage he has. Can we say that he is like a mediocre uh, general? Probably not, but again... No, he's not, a me he's, he's not a yeah. mediocre general. What he is, and this goes again back to what books does he read, once Frederick arrives on the battlefield, he is you would be hard pressed to find someone who was better than him. I, you know, again, I'm not a military historian, but uh, I did take a number. I did. We, I went to a university that had a good German history program. And one of the, well, hell, everybody knows I'm, I'm from new Orleans. We have the world war two museum in new Orleans. And one of the professors on staff there wrote a book called the German way of war, which is very good. And he gives talks about, German history, German, mil, specifically mil, German military history all the time. And I would go to him and I, I remember sitting through the talks on, um, on Frederick and there were some instances where they would show, and he's really interested in set piece tactics, like you were talking about earlier. And Frederick was able to essentially bend schematics from ancient and this is how battles were done tactically you know the, like they're it, almost like a chess game so there's the you know the sicilian defense you know or whatever this mm. is this is classically how you open a battle frederick was able to to like sort of map these ancient schematics onto gunpowder war better than anyone else 
particularly in his generation, but maybe ever. And so he is able to like, and then write about it later. Like he'll say, well, I just took this idea from Alexander at whatever. And then, you know, if you go look at what, you know, the, the, the schematics of how his battle played out, you're like, wow, that was, that was unaccountably brilliant. Yeah. That was, you know, but the thing he's not real good at is, he is not especially good. And I, I alluded to this earlier. He's not especially good at not having to fight disastrously costly battles. Okay. So he wins a lot of his battles, but in the process, he does decimate his population. <laughs> it's not okay. good. Yeah. I guess, uh, two, two things I, that also still came to mind about his battles. So, one is um, something that definitely has to be said about him also as a general is uh, he has a remarkable level-headedness, which of course is, a, is a, like probably, and, and Clausewitz definitely thinks so, so I feel confident saying that, even though I've never been in the army, but um, probably the uh, biggest factor in, in kind of like what sets generals apart from one another is how level-headed they can be under the stress of, of battle, because everything else is kind of derivative of that. So that's something that has to be said in favor of him. Uh, something that also has to be said against him is um, one of the, and it's, it's definitely, we know that it's not the main justification, but one of the ways he kind of goes about getting into the Silesian war and getting people ready is basically uh, by saying, or, or he basically stands up and says, I want the newspapers to write about me. Uh, this is this is the, the path to, to getting famous, basically, which is, in my opinion, uh, a bit questionable, kind of like, as a character, you know. Anyways, I think um, we leave it at that with our kind of like trying to give a, an outline of, of the historical man, uh, Frederick II. And now I want to cover, because of, of the kind of figure he is, because of the kind of like historical, yeah, a mystique that has been built around him, I want to cover um, history and historians and kind of like how we have this and well, how we have come to get this distorted picture of, of Frederick. And uh, one factor that also that I didn't put on the slides here, but one fact that also has to be said is um, Frederick uh, was a Freemason and Freemasonry, of course, becomes hugely culturally impactful uh, on European culture and is uh, at that time and is so uh, and the impact is there to this day even though I would say that Freemasonry doesn't have that like that influence anymore um, much of what we see as like common tropes everybody believes about history <coughs> actually things that are kind of like talking points in Freemasonic circles. So, for example, one of the reasons why the Catholic Church gets associated with kind of draconic measures is because those are myths that are perpetuated through Freemasonic circles that then get kind of like, they become what in Germany call salonfähig, kind of like um, they become the talking points of the, of the people in the, in the salons, in the uh, upper class, you know, um, opinion making rooms basically so of everybody who gets to have an opinion um, of everything that's fashionable I think is what we call it in English um, and that is a huge um, a huge factor on a history that most people aren't aware of and is a big selector to who we like and dislike in history um, and there's often Freemasons often kind of like um, yeah, celebrate themselves by pointing all, to all of those great historical figures who have been Freemasons, but often the reality is a bit the other way around. Many of these figures are quote unquote great historical figures because their association with Freemasons gives them this already pre existing uh, social prestige with important people because, of course, Freemasons are mostly. Uh, associated with social climbing and social prestige and being fashionable, which is effectively what the entire thing is about, if we're, if we're being honest. And I will do uh, a series on Freemasonry later on this channel because a lot of people 
like people always overplay it or underplay it. They either overplay it by saying, oh, it's basically like Satan, Satan's minions trying to bring about the destruction of the world, or they underplay it by basically saying, ah, no, it's just a bunch of guys. They've always just been hanging around and kind of not really doing anything. Both is not true. They're not really an active part. They're more of like a, like a, a very, uh, very present passive part that doesn't get talked about in the, and an influential culture that that has to be taken into account, but usually isn't. But so likely one of the reasons why we know him so well is through Freemasonry, you basically get very high chances at being a renowned person of history. So that's the first um, that's the first kind of connecting point here. Second one, I want to start from the bottom here is Voltaire. <sighs> I hate Voltaire. I think I can't say it on any other way. Um, here's the. Do you, do you want to give a, a quick rundown on Voltaire? I yes. like how you say friend at times. <laughs> yeah, because no, I'm just as bad on Voltaire as you. I, there are a couple. Of, I do. There. I. I can. I'm probably unlike you. I can read Voltaire and be entertained. <laughs> but but there the, he is like one of he is. There's no way to. He's a, I mean, he's a French philosopher uh, who I, I think most people's impression of Voltaire is probably the correct one. You know, he's a French philosopher. He's become he's, he's virtually un inseparable from this like idealized concept of the enlightenment. And he has no good ideas his entire life. They're all bad. Like there's yeah. like, there's I mean, not, there's not many people in the history of the world who are so consistently 100% on the wrong side. <laughs> I mean, philosopher really is something. Yeah, it's definitely uh, put into air quotes. I mean, I, I mark him down here as effectively a high-class gossip writer. So um, let me let me kind of give a paint a picture so people understand who Voltaire is, why he's important for the world we live in today. So um, first of all, again, at this time of the French or, or this this period preceding the French Revolution. Um, authority and kind of like social standing has been largely divorced from responsibility and work. So there are people who are responsible for things. There are people who work on the state. Um, people who take political responsibility. All of those are usually part of a massive state machine. And then there is the second class of beneficiaries of that, of what is what we basically call the nobility, which doesn't like in, in some degrees, share some of the responsibility, but not really, because they will usually try to escape it, and does none of the work. So they're basically a lazy class. Now, this lazy class needs something to do, and they get how these kind of people are. I mean, um, I don't know, like, I, I hope, like, everybody in the in the audience can somewhat, uh, like, um, identify with that, but in my life, I have seen many children of um, like wealthy families and they kind of break into two uh, into two categories. One is where the parents really try to train them into, you know, like being these like little overmans who run the family business later and are eternally competent and usually are also like a massive dump for the parents and securities and not being able to handle the responsibilities they're given. So they get like this intense amount of training um, to be able to yeah, basically become whatever the dad wanted to be. And then the other ones are just kind of like raised into being rich and never really having to care for anything. And um, they both are targetable with similar things in some regard, and that is they're targetable with niche, esoteric, gossip style information that they perceive as um, the, the, the one part as an advantage, the other part as terribly exciting. Voltaire is the person who provides this. Voltaire is not part of the upper class himself. Um, he is a, an intelligent youngster who finds a way to basically there's a state lottery going on at the time. He finds a way with a met mathematician to rig it so that they basically beat the house 
and uh, the odds are in their favor. So the more money they put into that state lottery, the more money they're getting out of it. He sets up this, um, so he gets a lot of very rich people together, which is how he gets his connections, and um, starts setting up this uh, scheme where they kind of try to cheat the French state out of money. And because they kind of like uh, spread out their earnings very well, they go on court for a very long time. So after that, he is basically a multi, multi millionaire. Um, I think not in the money of the times, but in today's money, definitely. Uh, so he's basically set for life and he spends his, the rest of his life kind of like um, pandering to his various wealthy audiences and generally basking in a sort of feeling of superiority. And because it is so fashionable at the time, um, it becomes hugely influential for the development of European culture. He starts an incredible amount of kind of like historical conceptions of different people, of different states. A lot of what we think about the period comes from him and from his writings, all of which really just serve to kind of pander to a like small minority of sheltered rich people. And I don't even have a problem with the rich, right? I don't have a problem with kings and lords and dukes as long as they're kind of like proper kings and lords and dukes and they can be as rich as, as they want to be. I don't really have an issue with that. What I have an issue with is these kind of like slugs of human being that just lie around on their wealth waiting to be entertained whom uh, he basically serves their, their daily spreads of gossip, pseudo-philosophy, and uh, other uh, hot topic ideas too. So that's Voltaire. He is at times a friend of Frederick, at times not so much. He writes a lot of sensational stuff about Frederick, about the homosexuality, he gives these ideas of Frederick's sexual licentiousness, basically everything again that you can really sell to um, these. They, they're almost like the, 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 these upper classes were almost like emerging uh, cosmopolitan figures. Um, so from him, we get this idea of Prussia's uh, super, um, super militarism, of Prussia again being a, uh, an army with a state attached to it and of this um yeah of this it, he really what, what he really does and, and we sometimes associate him with uh with the with the french revolution which he is also one of the let's say uh cultural influences that lead into revolutionary thought but at his time he really more tries to sell these great people right he writes the uh, Le siècle de uh, Louis XIV, so the the age of Louis XIV, I think is his, um, and he really tries to sell uh, these sort of ideas of these incredible personalities in Europe. And again, it doesn't really have anything to do with with uh, with reality. If he was alive today, he would be. Um, writing for these kind of like celebrity magazines that 14 year old girl, uh, girls read. And that is basically that level of understanding is the level of sophistication we have for a lot of that period of history. It's funny because I, I tend to think of Voltaire. I think if Voltaire were around today, he would probably be attracted to the mildly populist right wing press. That's, <laughs> that's yeah. A, that's where that's where I think he would be, but yeah. <laughs> um, that this might be the same thing though. Yeah, I mean, uh, Klausinken has has uh, put up the Mozart quote, which of course, I mean, it gets a bit too far because while well, we're supposed to pray for our enemies, and even though Voltaire is an obnoxious git, um, we can't really make him out to be an arch villain, but basically Mozart as, at the death of Voltaire says, I must give you a piece of intelligence that uh, perhaps you already know, namely that the ungodly arch villain Voltaire has died miserably like a dog, just like a brute. That is his reward. And then after that, Mozart also will go on to kind of like stress how he has always counted on God and how he has been rewarded by that. And of course, um, to be fair, Mozart also died like a dog. 
Well, he's such an entertaining character. Like that's a, that, that that's a that's a beautifully written bit of Mozart right there. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what kind of person he was. And then he started, <laughs> then he started cackling just like his character in that movie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all those creative types, man. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's Voltaire, basically again a gossip writer. Um, and then the person who I think, I mean, Voltaire probably also because Voltaire later he becomes associated with being more right wing post right. Yeah. Uh, post the revolution <laughs> yeah. because he writes in favor of kings technically, right? This is like Voltaire being right wing is like the sun being right wing, right? And Germany would be built being right wing, right? Those kind of magazines being right wing. It's just trash journalism, like who cares? Um, but the figure who I guess really sold Pierce Morgan, the... Pierce Morgan, that, that Voltaire is Pierce Morgan. There it is. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that. Yes, who <laughs> really sold those who want to revive European tradition and those who see the enlightenment as a tragic mishap in European history, the, the man who really sold the idea of Frederick II to them is the last person we talk about. I hope you're ready for this, Chris. Thomas Carlyle. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the high tier gossip writer. Okay, Chris, <laughs> I give you the floor. I want, I want to hear you. Come on. Um, well, you know, there's, I'm not going to really, not going to really dunk on Carlisle too much, but again, his, his choice of Frederick the Great here as a great man of history, I think there are some things about, about Carlisle's concept of the great man of history that I think are derived a little bit too much from Voltaire, um, and maybe, maybe a little bit too in agreement uh, occasionally with this, this this idea of what like a world historical force looks like. Um, so in this in this quest to find the sort of the idealized great man of history or whatever, Carlyle does find this this image. Okay, this 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 again the the the, the potato farmer, you know the the image of Cincinnatus Cincinnatus. Mm -hmm. Um, who like forcibly, who like with his left hand shields his country from the barbaric invasions of the Russians. And on the other hand, like hauls them forward into cultural greatness from nowhere. Okay. Is that, I think this is where we're, this is where we're coming from with Carlisle. Yeah. But I think he bites on the fake where, this country needed dragging out of the dragging out of the brutal past. I think a lot of times my issue with Carlisle is that I think he believes uncritically sometimes or takes too seriously sometimes the historical ideas of the previous generation. I think there are more of their assumptions embedded in him than he would like to let on. Okay. It's my only real problem. That that's not my. So only. let me let me give a short yeah. like introduction to Thomas Carlyle to to really understand what he is, what he's doing, and why he sells us um, Frederick II the way he does. So Thomas Carlyle is uh, a, a person in Victorian England, and Victorian England. I mean, this is this is rather recently. Let's say right if if we if we uh, kind of segment cultural events into epochs and like epochs where things are happening. We probably have something like uh, from the 50s to, I don't know, let's say the 90s. And then from the 90s to today, there's an epoch. And then before the 50s, there's probably like, um, like let's say back to the 20s something, right? Where there's an epoch of turmoil. And before that, that's basically Victorian England being the like cultural central force. Of course, we can talk, also talk about the... the well, I mean, it's recent enough that I knew people I have met in my... I'm 33. In my life, I have met people who were thoroughly Victorian. You know, yes. like <laughs> there. So, like, there's. I have living memory of someone who talked like a Victorian English person. Same accent. Exactly. Same it's 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 a story that just fizzled out. That like that that like just stopped existing. Right, like a few years ago, basically. Right. I mean, technically in the sixties, but still, that's a few years ago. Um, and Victorian England um, at the time is going through 
Uh, what we're seeing today in many ways, um, the, what we would call the liberals, um, these kind of like, um, yeah, these, these libertine forces are really like tearing at the cultural seams of England. Everything is to be democratized. Everything is to be run by, uh, by like certain decrees. Um, we have like this proto-socialism, this proto-communism going around everywhere. All of these ideas that we lament nowadays, these ideas of, of um, abandoning religion, of hierarchy being something hostile, of the family being something that is actually like a, a bad deal for everyone involved, basically. All of that is kind of starting to flare up in, in England. And all of these cultural currents mostly base themselves on the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. Against these are set people who try to steer Victorian England to another path, and they are commonly known as the reactionaries. Chief amongst them, the, uh, the one who is called the wisest, or, or he even gets the epithet, the wise, uh, the wise man sometimes, uh, being Thomas Carlyle, a very, very renowned writer, writing very extensively, very intelligently um, about, for example, why uh, democracy is a bad idea. There's one um, likeness that he has about statecraft that I use to this day. I really like it. It basically uh, likens the state to a ship. He says, on a ship, what decides what happens are the wind, the waves, and the cliffs. It doesn't matter if the, uh, all the sailors agree about uh, what, they, what needs to happen as long as they do what the wind, um, the waves, and the cliffs demand of them. And um, so he tries to propose a counter to these sort of like um, enlightenment-based, um, yeah, liberal, neoliberal ideas that are kind of trying to uproot the uh, cultural fundament of Victorian England, a society that we would uh, nowadays conceive of as like arch conservative, right? Incredibly high sexual morality standards, incredibly high presence of faith in everyday life, right? Incredibly high standards of social convenience, of social convention, so on and so forth. The reason why English culture is so high context, right? Why English people can have so much innuendo in the words they say and, and stuff like that is because of that culture being so solid and all of that was starting to go away. And his life's mission is really to protect that, to protect the, the uh, high morality, you know, high culture, uh, English Victorian culture uh, against those assailing forces that basically want to loosen up morals loosen up um, ideas of or like or loosen up influence and authority structures so on and so forth and he gets to the point to which many people get at the time and that is that all of these forces all of these like proto-socialist forces so on and so forth well there are real problems in the country and they just offer solutions and he doesn't and so at the end of his life, his final work is his history of Friedrich uh, II of Prussia um, as really his answer and his idea on how to tackle this. He really tries to give an alternative to, um, to kind of like almost dissolving the culture. And he, in many ways, like Nietzsche, um, kind of tries to construct this and, and, and I don't know to which degree he tries to construct it and to which degree he, he, he really thinks that it's the case but he tries to construct this larger than life mythos of the perfect monarch as a sort of remedying factor that is able to get the culture that he is, out of, that he is in out of a slump. And that is what the history of Frederick II of Prussia really is about. It's about trying to propose and find a monarch figure, a sort of like almost historical savior figure um, that will sort of absolve England from its historical and or from its 
current socio cultural and economic malaise. Well, don't you yeah. would point out, Andrew, it just, it, it, that this is not a specifically Carlisle. You've, you've alluded a couple of times to this, to this, to the mill, to the malaise that England found itself in during Thomas Carlyle's mm -hmm. life from the end, really from the loss of the American colonies all the way up to, and Carlisle lives well, well into the sun never sets on the British empire's self-conscious glory days. He does, but his early life is dominated by this, uh, this idea of this this kind of spectral malaise of decline and you know and, you know d dirtiness and 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 um, this is a common trope you know we, we it's a good, I think it's Wordsworth it's yes Wordsworth we're, we're, no maybe it's not Wordsworth it's one of these romantics you would think I would know you would think I would have these, <laughs> I of all people would have these names penned down ready to go but I will forget them sometimes but the the, the poem is Milton now should be living at this hour you know England hath need of thee she's you know my God, so on and so forth um there's this general idea that England is 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 in need of some sort of restorationist figure and yeah I, Carlisle there the I, the problem I have with Thomas Carlisle again is that he does in his there is a bit of german german dialectical philosophy in him and i see this in the dissident right a lot and this is the thing one of the things about him that bothers me which is that if my opponents think one thing then me thinking then me thinking and believing the exact opposite thing will affect will proceed will you know further my goals and in, in the ability to, it, this is a very imperfect thing to be able to do. And what Thomas Carlyle does in this text is he sets down to create, he, he is not ever very concerned as a historian with whether or not his histories uh, correspond with the reality of the subjects that he's talking about. He, he makes um, factual errors in his histories all the time. And they were pointed out by his contemporaries. He didn't care because that's not what he's it's not what he's after. He's after this mythology of a person. OK. And he again, like he's he does not particularly care whether or not Frederick the Frederick the second is this character who by sheer force of will rises up and protects on one hand and transforms Prussia into the reactionary world power that the 19th century starts to think of it as for some reason. Um, he, in doing so though, he does sort of buy into an idea of, he buys into an, a narrative history that Marx agrees with and a number of other, a number of figures agree with, which is that first of all, is that these is that these characters have uh, have created a world that was fundamentally different from what came before. Like 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 the the mind of Frederick the Great Great emanated some energy that uh, that, that that protected, altered, or created something in in Prussia that you know was fundamentally different and was bent to his will it doesn't take it that, that maybe frederick was just a um relatively talented princeling who um took over a state in central europe and you know won some wars with it but other than that is not really all that outstanding or out you know, not really definitive of his own times. Like, for instance, like the vast majority of people in Germany during his life were, were still Christians. In fact, he's, he's in this sense, he's at odds with his own people of whom he is, you know, of, of you know, of, of whose champion he is. Um, there's this idea that, you know, that maybe that there, that some sort of restorative th thing need to happen. What, what was wrong with Prussian culture before, you know, before Frederick the Great came along. And so what you really end up with it with and Carlyle in particular, and this is his most ideological text, I think either on Heroes Worship or this one is the most ideological text, is that it is an attempt more so to use an idea of history to construct what he believes is a thought framework that will resist modernity, okay? An essentially reactionary uh 
and not reactionary in the good sense, an essentially reactionary perspective on the world um, that I think has been very bad for the right wing and, and that it's, we we're still sort of stuck in it is this, this sort of this idea that by believing some narrative about the past that we can in fact, you know, just will into existence these arbitrary forces or this arbitrary man that's going to alter the future. Sorry. No, it's uh, very many great points you've, you've pointed on. And I think I really want to piggyback on that in many ways because what I'm trying to do in this channel, if, if, if you kind of, uh, if anyone here like looks at the, uh, at the main series, the ones who have um, the numbers right in front of them, the, the zero point so and so forth videos, um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do exactly that. I'm trying to formulate a, a framework that is uh, not just able to withstand modernity or, or post-modernity, which we are in, but actually superior to it. Um, even just like mostly driven actually from the simple reality that I otherwise could not exist in this world because I cannot under good conscience uh, rely on the modern way of, of seeing things. Um, so I'm, I'm more or less necessitated in doing that. And um, he does uh, something I, I have spoken about in one of my videos. It was the one on chaos at the end, something I call satanic polarization, where basically he does exactly what, what, what you say. He sees evil somewhere and basically thinks that he can create good by inverting it. But the thing with evil is that people don't understand is the inverted form of evil is still evil. Right, it's like if you crumb, like if you have a crumpled piece of paper and you put it inside out, it's still crumpled because what it's actually supposed to be is is out out, out straight. And and uh, if you don't already have that reference point by which you can correctly judge um, a thing, which you often don't, and which actually uh, God even warns you about, right? That very, very often you just don't have that ability. You don't have that authority to judge over a situation. Then you cannot actually uh, make any sort of, derive any sort of like inverse value, but you can only derive residual positive value. So basically when you look at something like um, modernity going on and you are not sufficiently, let's say, spiritually advanced that you can see it through God's eyes. What you need, and, and, and most of us, of course, aren't, what you need to do is rather to latch on to its positive points than try to invert its negative points into positives. And that is what Carlyle does. That is what many people try to do nowadays, which is why, of course, you, for example, have so many people trying to revive, um, trying to revive, uh, national socialism or whatever, because they're decried by today's culture. But you cannot derive from, from the things today's culture hates or from the failings of today's culture, uh, a positive culture through inversion, because you don't know the proper way to invert it. If you knew, then let's say, that sort of inversion would just become like part for the course, right? It wouldn't be something that needs to be terribly engineered. You would very easily know, okay, this is where we are. This is where this can go. And uh, the, the question becomes almost just one of, you know, allocating resources basically of engineering. So um, that is also something I would definitely say about Carlyle is that he, in a sense, fundamentally fails in his endeavor as much as I, um, sympathize with with him, and as much as I see the uh, ideas and, and and kind of like misgivings he has about his time, um, and I think also one of the things is, is simply also that he tries to um, tries to situate himself within, even though he does what you do, where he kind of like neglect neglects historical accuracy, he still tries to situate himself within the sort of let's say historical sophistication, which just doesn't leave room for things like faith. And I think Carlyle would say that kind of like taking his 
taking his journey, taking his effort on faith is something he could never do. And I think that is why he never got ultimately like rewarded for it. Yeah, I think that 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 works. I think, but one of the things about Carlisle that I do like to point out also is that he will sometimes be presented to dissidents as like some type of like secret figure that like might have the. But and this is this is there's this about Carlisle and the weight against his obvious utility. But modern academics are very familiar with Carlisle, and it's not unusual to encounter Carlisle as the nominal, as the dummy, you know, like the the, the test dummy bad guy in, mm. um, in especially, I was talking about this with academic agent the other night, actually, because um, I, we were, in my university, we were presented with Carlisle in uh, an undergrad critical theory class. Um, he is, uniquely especially in america i think this is less the case in america thomas carlisle actually had a much bigger effect on america than he did on even england uh, as a result of his involvement however inadvertently in the onset of the american civil war so mainstream mainstream academics in the united states have a very special like a uh, sort of formula for treating Thomas Carlyle that um, makes him an easy person. Like if you're thinking to yourself that as the right wing, we're going to have to discover old forgotten authors and, you know, and, and, and use them to build a worldview that will like, that will dive, that will create a divergent present. Well, it hates for Carlyle is one that they are absolutely prepared for. That is like that is like like like, like you know we found we found the secret trail that they want, and then you sh you find their most you know you find their most impregnable fortress after you've gone <laughs> further further than you can, you know, without turning around. They are aware of Carlisle, and in fact, Carlisle has influenced the 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 contemporary regime far more so than 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 people probably imagine. He is, he is uh, you know, who of, of all people got into that a little bit with academic agent actually was Moldbug. Kurt, old Curtis Yarvin got whenever he was talking about um, Ruskin versus versus Carlisle and Ru John Ruskin is I like John Ruskin more personally, but John Ruskin and that, that's and he's an even more politically dangerous figure, actually, because, you know, uh, Ruskin is a figure that bleeds over into Fabian socialism. But um these uh, he's another one of these figures that we call the Victorian sages. Um, they are maybe not well known to like Joe Blow on the streets, but most educated people and and educated leftists will at least be familiar with these persons like Thomas Carlyle, the cyclical history thing. Uh, that's usually how Carlisle comes up. So it's like it's, it's, everyone is, he's the example of cyclical history and the great man theory of history. And you, the other, the, the opposition is pretty calibrated towards disarming that some of these theories. So I, I, I don't believe in the political utility of Carlisle as much as some people do. That was a rant and kind of a, kind of, kind of off topic. I apologize. That's yes, it's perfectly fine. Um, but I think we'll round it out now. The stream is definitely, it's probably the longest one we've had so far. Yeah, definitely yeah. the longest one we've had so far. Um, with the beautiful question, which I really like. If Frederick II was a historical chess world champion, who would he have been? This is the most German question. I've, I only know two. I only know one chess chess world chess champion is i don't think i don't think bobby fisher is gonna is who we're looking for here <laughs> I mean, the meme answer is always bobby fisher yeah because of course bobby fisher is the greatest character in chess but i just would want to give as an answer to kind of like point out the way he's probably most best approached as he is not like an exceptional statesman but he's also not like an unimportant figure or someone who like who we can say oh there's like really only myths around him but in reality you know he he didn't really amount to much the the person i would probably liken him to is is uh, the very recent eternal number two hikaru nakamura right because at any other time hikaru would have been like the best chess player in the world it just so happens that magnus carlsen was better right frederick ii definitely is an 
uh, cut above average, um, cut above average king, and cut above average sovereign. And um, let's say if if we compare him to um, like only let's say a select amount of people, um, he usually gets to the very top of that pile, right? And all of this, of course, I'm always a bit more aggressive on Prussian history in these streams than I really am, let's say, in my heart. And I kind of try to play it down more than I really do think about it for the main reason of kind of trying to mostly dispel the Prussian myth, right? So because just in my experience, people kind of rebound a bit because they don't want to take someone's uh, opinions just outright. So um, I was also for the people who don't, I want to give this counter. Like it's not that like Prussia is this like hyper, I don't know, like this again, this this pariah of the world, cursed, uniquely cursed by God, trying to spite him at every opportunity. Um, and yeah, he was, um, although of course I kind of call into question his uh, his epithet, the great, because there's only a very small select group of people who get the great. He is not far off, right? So he's not the world chess champion. He's probably not Frederick the Great, but it's not like he is, you know, uh, a bad player either. So I would go with Nakamura also because Nakamura actually is kind of known for his personality flaws behind the scenes. And uh, it's a bit similar with Frederick here. Okay, so um, I would say this ends the stream. I thank everyone as always for having taken their time with me. Um, this is a very long one. So if you made it to the end, uh, thank you very, very much. Congratulations. It means a lot of me that you basically leave like two hours of your day, two and a half hours of your day to listen to me and Chris. Chris, of course, thank you very much uh, for always being here with me. And uh, yeah, goodbye everyone.